we're gonna we're gonna move fast. So <clears throat> we see when the seven potters chapter ends, they get attacked. We see Voldemort, we see Harry's wand do something strange in his hand and hits Voldemort. Um, and we have Harry and, and um, Hagrid falling. Chapter 5, Fallen Warrior. Okay, Notice the chapter title. You immediately assume what? You meet somebody dies. And then the very first word, Hagrid? That's cruel, isn't it? I mean, because she's intending us to assume it's Hagrid, right? So, turns out not to be Hagrid. It's Moody, right? So we're going to skip a bunch. Um, round page 70. <clears throat> Harry tells them what happened. There's Lupin and Earth Weasley and such. Um, he says, you know, he saw Stan Shunpike, etc. And Lupin says, Harry, the time for disarming is past. These people are trying to capture and kill you, at least stun if you aren't prepared to kill. Harry explains why he wasn't going to stun him. And Lupin then replies, Yes, Harry, and a great number of Death Eaters witnessed that happening. That is, I used Expelliarmus against Voldemort in the Golden Thing. Okay? Forgive me, but it was a very unusual move then. Unusual move. What was it Dumbledore said Harry had? Two things that Voldemort doesn't. Uncommon. Uncommon skill and a power that Voldemort knows not. Love. Uncommon skill, unusual skill. I think that's what he's saying. Okay. Repeating it tonight in front of the Death Eaters who either witnessed or heard about the first occasion was close to suicidal. So Harry makes the next logical connection. So I should have killed Stan. Of course not. But, you know, attack back. Expelliarmus is a useful spell, Harry, but the Death Eaters seem to think it is your signature move now. Okay? So Harry says, you know, I'm not going to kill people. That's Voldemort's job. We see George come in, and he's, you know, groping the side of his head, and he responds to Mrs. Weasley when she asks, how do you feel Georgie saint-like? And Fred's like, oh my God, dude, it's kind of crazy. What do you mean? What's wrong with him? Saint-like, you see? I'm holy. Holy, Fred. Get it? Notice when he first says holy, the book says this. And then he says, holy... But this time, it's italicized. Why? Okay. This is speech, right? I think we're meant to assume that this is like George spelling it out. Because if he says holy and holy, they sound exactly the same. Get it? George. Uh, Fred, pathetic. With the whole wide world of ear-related humor before you, you go for holy? Name one ear joke. The whole wide world of ear humor. Okay. Get it? Okay. Notice, by the way, George says he's holy. Patron saint of England. Saint George. April 23rd is St. George's Day. It's Shakespeare's birthday and death day. But calling himself a saint or a, calling himself holy also says what? I mean, if you take this semi-literally. Says religion. Okay. I don't want to, you know, have a Harry Potter religion. I'm not going there. But he's kind of suggesting he's a murderer. Now, Usually, when you use the term murder, what you mean by that is someone who dies for a cause. I mean, you can be a martyr for anything. You don't have to be a martyr simply for a religious belief. You can be a martyr for a philosophical belief, or a political belief, etc., etc. Right? But in its looser use, martyr means also someone who is injured or wounded. 
for a cause. Right? What did Malfoy call Harry? Patronus Potter. Saint Potter. Okay? So, others start coming in. Bill comes in. Mrs. Weasley says, thank God, thank God. It's the first time in, uh, excuse me, earlier when um, Harry finds out that George is okay, Harry says, thank God. And you're going to start seeing that a lot in this book, okay? Bill comes in, and Bill mentions Mad-Eye's dead, okay? So somewhere around 79, 78 to 80, they're still talking, and Tonks says, Voldemort acted exactly as Mad I thought he would. That is, Voldemort went after who? He went after the strongest person, because that's who he thought would be protecting Harry, right? He chased Mad Eye first when Mundungus gave them away. He switched to Kingsley. That's telling us Kingsley's the next most powerful, okay? Notice he doesn't go after Hagrid. Could be. I thought he did, though. At the yeah, end. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, at the end. So, Fleur, Fleur suggests somebody ratted him out. And Harry says, no. We've got to trust each other. I trust all of you. I don't think anyone in this room would ever sell me to Voldemort. Lupin has kind of an odd expression. Harry, you think I'm a fool? Lupin, no, I think you're just like James, who would have regarded it as the height of dishonor to mistrust his friends. And Harry rightly interprets what Lupin is suggesting there. And look what happened to James. Because he didn't think any of his friends would rat him out badly. Okay? So they decide they've got to go do something about Mad Eye's body. Why? They don't want it. They don't want it used as an inferior. Why else? Because they also don't want it. He deserves it. They don't want uh, the Death Eaters to be floating around. Right. Okay. You don't you don't allow the dead to be essentially desecrated. Okay. So Harry says, I've got to go. They're like, what? No, you can't. And Mrs. Weasley asked Harry, where's Hedwig? Couldn't tell her. Drink some whiskey. And then Hagrid goes, you did it again, Harry. You defeated Voldemort again. Harry says, it wasn't me. My wand acted of its own accord. Okay. He says, the bike was falling. I couldn't have told you where Voldemort was. But my wand spun in my hand and found him. Now, he makes it sound like he's holding the wand like this. So, and the wand spun in his hand. He doesn't say the wand spun my hand, okay? It spun in my hand. Later on, later on, first page of the chapter, uh, chapter 18, Life and Lies of Albus Dumbledore. Bottom of the second paragraph, she had not felt the wand spin like the needle of a compass and shoot golden flames at his hand, excuse me, at his enemy, okay? My wand spun in my hand, found him, shot a spell at him. It wasn't even a spell I recognized. I've never made gold flames appear before, okay? So he's saying the, the wand did this because the others are going to say, no, 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 Harry, you did it. Mr. Weasley makes a, you know, tries to give a explanation and says, you know, small children often find. <laughs> Harry says, no. Dumbledore would have believed him. Later on, towards the bottom of that page. But Dumbledore, like Mad Eye, like Sirius, like his parents, like his poor owl. Should we start naming names at the end of the book? No. All were gone where Harry could never talk to them again. 
Well, that's not quite true, though, is it? Well, okay. Why else is it not quite true? Okay, where else? Okay, resurrection stone. Even simpler. Just talking to him? Don't they have like the magic portrait? Ringo. At least Dumbledore, mm -hmm. there's now a portrait of him in the headmaster's office. Ooh, yeah, but it's still, they talk. They talk. I mean, what does Hermione have stuffed in her bag? Phineas Nigellus. Okay. So, but there's got to be more than one window. I mean, one more than one portrait. That's why she can do that and he can report you know back to what's going on at Hogwarts and stuff. Okay. Yeah but those aren't actual portraits I don't think. Okay. So chapter six, ghoul in the pajamas, we're gonna skip most of till we get to near the end, around page one oh two. Hermione pulls out of her Mary Poppins bag, because that's essentially what it is, you know books that she got from from Dumbledore's. And she says she's been reading about Horcruxes. This round page 102. Um, she says, I can it's the less I can believe that he actually made six. It warns in this book how unstable you make the rest of your soul by ripping it. That's just by making one Horcrux. Ron, is there any way of putting yourself back together again? That is, can Humpty Dumpty be fixed? Yes. But it would be excruciatingly painful. Why? How do you do it? Asked Harry. Remorse. Now that's, that's not what most people think of as excruciatingly painful. You've got to really feel what you've done. There's a footnote. Apparently the pain of it can destroy you. I don't see Voldemort attempting it somehow. Can you? So she gives Harry the idea. Here's how you can repair yourself. But you have to feel remorse. If you want a good idea for remorse... Depending on which Bible you have, because um, the Psalms are numbered slightly differently according to which version. Psalm 50 or Psalm 51 by David, okay, um, is a good example of remorse. It's the Psalm David writes after um, being found out about his sin with Bathsheba and such, right? So they keep talking, and Hermione says, okay, now. Here's how we get rid of a Horcrux. Say this is a Horcrux. It's got Voldemort's soul in it. You got to find something to destroy this. Not a hammer. Hammer's not going to destroy it, okay? Because it's magically protected. Ron's like, okay, so if we just wreck the thing it lives in, why can't we just, why can't the bit of soul in it just go and live in something else? She says, because a Horcrux is the complete opposite of a human being. Ron and Harry are like, what? So she explains. If I picked up a sword right now, Ron, and ran, ran you through with it, it wouldn't damage your soul at all. Him, he's like, gee, thanks. She says, no, it should be. My point is that whatever happens to your body, your soul will survive untouched. The fragment of soul inside a horcrux depends on its container. So if you can find the right thing to destroy the container, you destroy the thing inside. What did Harry do with the diary? Basilisk Fang. Okay. So they go on and figure that out about the Basilisk Fang. So what could they theoretically do? Uh, go back to Hogwarts, go down into the Chamber of Secrets, find the dead Basilisk, pull another Fang out. Be a little bit to do. Okay. So go on to the will of Albus Dumbledore. You're still at the Weasleys. And Mrs. Weasley gives Harry what for his birthday? It was actually my brother Fabian's. Where have we seen the name Fabian before? Okay, tapestry. Fabian Pruitt. The picture that Moody showed Harry in book five of the original Order of the Phoenix. There were Fabian and Gideon Pruitt. I think it was Fabian said something like, it took six death eaters to take him down. Okay? Notice about the watch. It's got a ding in it. He wasn't terribly careful with his possessions. It's a bit dented on the back. Might there be a reason why it's a bit dented on the back? 
Because if I remember right, he was one they only found bits of. Like, the watch might have been with the bits. I'm not saying it was. I don't know for sure. But it could be like a relic, you know, something that was with him when he died, right? So, Jenny gives him his birthday, you know. Uh, we're going to skip a bit. So, um, Scrimger shows up <clears throat> with Dumbledore's will, okay? And each of them have something. What does Hermione get from Dumbledore? <coughs> tales of Beautiful the Bard, <clears throat> which are what? Children's tales. They're fairy tales, okay? What does Hermione think of fairy tales? Why not? Fairy tales don't give you information. Stories don't give you information. They give you stories. Hermione likes nonfiction. She likes to read essays and history and science, okay? What does Ron get? The deluminator, which is also called the putter outer. It's the thing that when Dumbledore first shows up, number four, Privet Drive, first book, he sits there and goes, and the lights all go out, okay? What does Harry get? Golden Snitch from his very first match. And the Sword of Godward Griffin, where he's supposed to get the sword, okay? So... Scrimger leaves, and Harry notices the writing. I open at the close, and he's like, I don't know what that means. Chapter 8, The Wedding. We see Xenophilius Lovegood there, and dressed all in yellow. Okay. Crumb is there. Why? Invited by Fleur. Okay. We see Ginny. And we hear, hear her real name, her full name for the first time, Ginevra, which is a form of Guinevere. Okay. Um, we see the ceremony, as much of it as we do see. Notice the guy says, I don't know what page this is on. This is... Right about in the middle. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we're gathered here today to celebrate the union of two faithful souls. Blah, 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 blah. Do you, William Arthur, take Fleur Isabel? And then they do, and we hear, then I declare you bonded for life. Which I think is kind of interesting. Bonded for life sounds like the serpent. Damn racer again. Um... Sounds kind of similar to another spell we've seen. If you're bonded for life, then what can you not do? You can't break it. Isn't that kind of like the unbreakable vow? We're not told, are we? We're not told. Okay? But it's interesting because... Do we see or hear or read anywhere in any of the seven books about divorce? It's never mentioned. We know Snape's father left his mother, ran out on her. Voldemort's father left his wife, ran out on her. We know of other families where, you know, one member has died or something like that, but we never hear about a couple being split up, where they're both living within the magical world, so to speak. I just find it odd because she brings in so much other stuff from the real world that she doesn't, <coughs> kind of doesn't touch on that. And I wonder if, if there's something there there. I don't know if there is or not. Okay. So anyways, Harry starts talking to Crumb, and Crumb mentions the symbol on Xenophilius Lovegood's gown. What does it look like? 
line going into the wilderness, the line going down the river. And he assumes what about that symbol? It's Grindelwald. It's Grindelwald's, and therefore it's evil. Okay? Talks about people copying it down, you know, people being mean and all that kind of stuff. So, here he um, speaks with Elphias Doge and talks with him about Rita Skeeter and the article in the Daily Prophet about Dumbledore being involved in the dark arts. And Doge says, don't believe a word of it. Not a word, Harry. Let nothing tarnish your memories of Albus Dumbledore. And we're told Harry thinks. Did Doge really think it was that easy? That Harry could simply choose not to believe. Okay. Notice that's a negative, right? So you also have to look at it from this context. Which of these is it? Did Harry, did Doge really think Harry could simply choose not to believe? Did, didn't Doge understand Harry's need to be sure to know? So, this is juxtaposed to this. Knowing deals with what? Facts. Seemingly. Facts. Truth. Knowledge. Belief? Not necessarily. I don't believe that 2 plus 2 equals 4. I know that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Why? Because I could pull out the 10 ones I have in my wallet, and I can put 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4. I don't have to believe that. I believe there is a God. I cannot prove that. I cannot say. I cannot, you know, that kind of thing. So notice what's going, what's, what the fight is in Harry's mind. It's belief versus truth or fact or knowledge. Okay? The reason I spend a little bit of time on this is that phrase about choosing to believe or choosing not to believe is going to get repeated several times throughout the remainder of the novel. What was it he said to Lupin and Arthur Weasley Back in a frosty Christmas in the previous book. How do we know? How do we know that Dumbledore's right? How do we know to trust Snape? But there, what he's looking for is truth or facts, but you'll never get truth or facts when it comes to that kind of answer. Because it's always going to come down there to what you believe and how you believe it. Okay, so Doge goes on, talks about Rita Skeeter, and Auntie Muriel comes in. And what does Muriel do? Oh, I love Rita Skeeter. Okay, and she talks about, I dare say, you'll still think he was a saint, even if it does turn out he did away with his squib sister. The chill that had nothing to do with the iced champagne was stealing through Harry's chest. Chest, seat of passion, seat of love. He's been talking with Doge. Doge has been doing what? Building up that fire, that trust in Dumbledore. Auntie Muriel comes in and does what? She pours cold water on it. That's why the chill spreads. Okay? Harry asks, what do you mean? And so she goes on this big spiel. And she and Doge kind of go back and forth. Page 157. Muriel swigged yet more champagne. Who is Muriel supposed to be the wizarding world mirror image of? Aunt Marge. Aunt Muriel, Aunt Marge. Okay? The recitation of these old scandals seemed to elate her as much as they horrified Doge. And we all know people who revel in other people's bad news, right? Other people's failures, other people's scandals, etc. Harry did not know what to think, what to believe. 
He wanted the truth. What does he want, really? He wants Dumbledore to come back from the dead and lay the cards all out. Here's the truth, Harry. Beginning of your life to the end of your life. Here's how every little bit makes sense. Or beginning of Dumbledore's life. In other words, I can't use that's an analogy from my other class. I can't use it. Okay, never mind. So, he doesn't know what to think. Harry could hardly believe that Dumbledore would not have intervened if such cruelty was happening inside his own house. In other words, he can believe it, but it's hard to believe it. In other words, to believe what Harry's just heard, he has to do what? He has to really work at it. Okay? Muriel goes on, and we find out the ministry has fallen. Chapter 9. Hermione takes them to Tottenham Court Road. Okay? She mentions Voldemort's name. Growl and the others come in. Harry zaps them without, you know, them even thinking about it. And Travis pointed out, you know, Ron says, you know, you need to do a memory charm. And Hermione says, I don't know how, but I know the theory. And yet earlier in the book, she tells him in the chapter, The Ghoul in the Pajamas, that she modified her parents' memories. I think there might be an explanation, and the explanation is that modifying a memory is not the same as obliviate. Obliviate means wipe it, wipe it clean. Okay. Yeah, because you're still working with what's there. You're just kind of taking snatches out. So they no longer think they have a daughter. Their names are now Monica and Wendell Wilkins or something like that. And they live in Australia. Okay. Notice, by the way, one of my colleagues, Professor Reed, who's done the course with me in London a couple of times, pointed this out. Um, and, and the more I think about it, the more I think he's right. Notice how much leeway there is in the magical world to do things to other people without their permission, without there being any kind of legal recourse. I mean, to be able to go into somebody's mind and modify their memories without there being any checks on that, any... any Laws broken? It just seems really odd. Could be. But I mean, I mean, yeah, that was earlier when Harry was underage. They're now not underage anymore. Okay, so they're they can legally do magic. But just the fact that anybody, any wizard or witch, could Modify somebody else's memory. Like the stuff Rita Skeeter does like to, uh, um, to get all the information like from the book. From Dr. Dildo. And the Hilda like she goes into her mind and gives her yeah. a serum. And or Chamber of Secrets. What Gilderoy Lockhart did. Mm -hmm. He got all that information from those people and then whoosh, wiped their memories. Okay? Mm -hmm. And there's no repercussion. I mean, the, the legal system within the just uh, the wizarding world seems really odd. Well, I think it's because uh, in, like, they, they're allowed to use the Obliviate charm because, like, what a muggle sees when he sees magic or something like that. Yeah. Like, and because the, the ministry, they, they, they can still track people using magic. They can see what, the, you know, the recent spells were cast on their wand and everything. Yeah, but how do they know? Like, they don't, they don't know. They don't do a weekly checkup on everyone. Every week, so. Yeah. Okay, so. Yeah, right, right. So then, towards the end of that chapter, um, Harry sees, Harry has one of his Voldemort visions, and he sees Draco. And he hears Voldemort. Draco, give Raoul another taste of our displeasure. Do it or feel my wrath yourself. Harry felt sickened by what he had seen, by the use to which Draco was now being put by Voldemort. Draco's now what? 
Death Eater, Torturer, he's the gun. He's the billy club. He's the stick. Okay, essentially. Chapter 10, Creature's Tale. Third paragraph. The grief that possessed him since Dumbledore's death felt different now. The accusations he had heard from Uriel at the wedding, notice, seemed to have nested in his brain like diseased things, infecting his memories of the wizard he had idolized. Interesting choice of words. Why? What happens to every idol we create? It doesn't live up to your idolization of it. It, it it can't, right? What does Dumbledore repeatedly, what did Dumbledore <coughs> repeatedly tell Harry? That he's not perfect. He's not perfect. I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. And if I make good ones, then, yeah. So, Harry thinks of Godric's Hollow, and he thinks, why hadn't Dumbledore told him? Why hadn't he explained? Had Dumbledore actually cared about Harry? Or had Harry been nothing more than a tool to be polished and honed, but not trusted, never confided in? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. So, he finds the snippet of a letter by his mom, okay, and he thinks the only important information in there is the possible information on Dumbledore. Not quite right. And they find the picture. They start talking about Matilda Bagshot and such. And Harry tells Ron and Hermione about the stuff Muriel said. And Hermione, <coughs> Hermione says, Harry, do you really think you'll get the truth from a malicious old woman like Muriel or from Rita Skeeter? Well, what kind of truth does he know you get from Rita Skeeter? When does she tell the truth? Yeah, only when she's threatened, extorted. Okay. How can you believe them? Notice what she's saying. You've gotten information from them that you believe. He doesn't factually know it to be true. How can you believe them? You knew Dumbledore. How well does he know Rita Skeeter? Not very. He knows she's a sorry piece of work. What about Auntie Muriel? She's a drunk. You knew Dumbledore. Thought I did. But you know how much truth there was in everything she wrote about you? Rita wrote about you. Doge is right. How can you let these people tarnish your memories of Dumbledore? What tarnishes? What kind of metal tarnishes? Brass. Brass? Silver? Does gold? Nope. Okay. Tarnishing doesn't destroy the metal. It just accumulates on it. Harry looks away. There it was again. Choose what to believe. He wanted truth. Why? Because if he has truth, he doesn't have to do what? Believe. He doesn't have to make a choice. It's hard to make a choice, right? What did Dumbledore say to the students? The end of your feast in book four. If you have a choice to do what is hard or what is easy, choose the right thing. Notice, it's, it's not going to be laid out. It's not going to be, this is the clear thing you should do. How many of you have had in your lives, you know, an arrow pointing exactly to where you should go? Telling you exactly what you should do. You're walking down a hallway and the door opens and it says, come inside. None of us have that experience. That's what Harry wants, though. He doesn't want to have to think about it. Okay? Why was everyone so determined he should not get it? It what? The truth. What did Dumbledore say about the truth? End of the first book. It is a beautiful and terrible thing, Harry, but I won't lie to you. And he didn't. He didn't tell him the truth. He told him part of the truth at the end of book five. But he didn't tell him the whole truth, right? So, they try to find the locket. Because they now realize the locket they have isn't the real one. And they don't find it. 
so we get Creature's Tale. Hermione has to explain elf magic isn't like wizard's magic. Okay. So Creature tells them what he did for Regulus Black for Voldemort. Okay. And what did Regulus Black tell him to do? Switch the lockets. And then come back. See, he wasn't supposed to come back, according to Voldemort. Okay? He was supposed to die in the cave. But because Master Regulus gave him a command, he had to. Okay? Voldemort didn't, think, didn't even think that would happen. So, Hermione explains how, Siri, how um, Creature thinks and such. And... Harry hears Dumbledore's words in his head saying, I do not think Sirius ever saw a creature as a being with feelings as accurate as a human's. So, Harry says to creature, when you feel up to it, please sit up. What is, why is the when you feel up to it so important? It's not an order. It's not an order. It's, not a, it's whenever you are ready. Okay? And so, he tells him to go find Mundungus Fletcher, and he gives him the locket. Because the locket was his master's, and it's a relic of sorts with him. The bribe, we're going to skip a bunch. We read about Harry, page 207 and following, being wanted and questioning for the death of Albus Dumbledore. Lupin shows up. He says, you know, it's genius on Voldemort's part to implicate you in, Dumbledore, in Dumbledore's death. You that everybody thought would, you know, pure as wind-driven snow. And so he tells them about the Muggle-Born Registration Commission. Wrong. People won't let this happen. Lupin, it is happening, Ron. Remember the quote I put up on the board the other day? All that is necessary for evil to thrive is for good men to do nothing. Ron says it won't happen. Lupin says good men are doing nothing. Why? Because they don't want to die. Right? So, people like Hermione now have got to prove their magicalness, I guess. What else do we find out in this chapter? What does Lupin offer them? I can come. I can help you. And Harry's like, okay, wait a second, let me think. You want to leave Tonks at her parents' house and come away with us. She'll be safe there. I'm sure James would have wanted me to stick with you. Well, I'm not. Pretty sure my father would have wanted to know why you aren't sticking with your own kid, actually. <coughs> Lupin's face drains. Why? Harry just took what Lupin said and did what to it? He interpreted it. Okay? As Harry is wont to do. Lupin, you don't understand. Why? Probably because Harry's too young. Harry, well, explain. I made a grave mistake in marrying Tonks. I did it against my better judgment. I've regretted it very much ever since. So, Harry again interprets that. Oh, I see. So you're just going to dump her and the kid and run off with us. Lupin jumps up. Don't you understand what I've done to my wife and my unborn child? I should never have married her. What's the problem with what Lupin is saying? But you did. That's the point. You did marry her. You did knock her up. Okay, She is pregnant with your child. Too late for a should of nevers. I've made her an outcast. Okay, He says, you guys have only ever seen me amongst the order. Outside the order, I'm a pariah. My kind don't usually breed. Breed. It will be like me, I am convinced. How can I forgive myself when I knowingly risk passing on my own condition to an innocent child? Passing on my own condition. Take it out of the realm of fantasy and what's this like? Passing on AIDS or HIV or any other disease to an unborn child. Hermione's like, Remus, nobody would be ashamed of you. Harry, I don't know. I would. 
Harry did not know where his rage was coming from, but it propelled him to his feet, too. So now Harry and Lupin are standing opposite each other, you know, kind of wand at the ready. If the new regime thinks Muggleborns are bad, Harry says, what will they do to a half werewolf whose father's in the order? And I think Lupin at that point, probably the tension drops just a little bit because he thinks, well, maybe Harry's starting to understand. My father died trying to protect my mother and me, and you reckon he'd tell you to abandon your kid to go on an adventure? Oh, how dare you? This is not about how dare you suggest. I think you're feeling a bit of a daredevil. Fancy stepping into Sirius' shoes. <coughs> what's, what's Harry doing? Intentionally. Why? To go back home. And Harry's going to get to his point in just a moment. Hermione goes, Harry, no. Line, you stepped across. No. I'd never have believed this. The man who taught me to fight Dementors. That's how. And Lupin zaps him. Lupin leaves. Run, you shouldn't have said that. And we're told, before Harry replies, here's what he sees. Sirius falling through the veil. Broken images were racing each other through his mind. Sirius falling through the veil. Dumbledore suspended, broken in midair. A flash of green light, his mother's voice begging for mercy. Parents, said Harry, shouldn't leave their kids unless, unless they've got to. Now, I could be wrong, but I think that's partly J.K. Rowling dealing with her own mother's death. Because her mother died before she actually published the first novel. Rowling was 22, 23, when her mom died, and her mom was like 44. She had started writing them. I think she had gotten the Humanities Grant from the Scotland Humanities Council, but she hadn't finished it. Her mom died, and she was a child welfare mother essentially. Parents shouldn't leave their kids unless unless they've got to. Hermione tries to say something to Harry. He shrugs her off. I know I shouldn't have called him a coward. No, you shouldn't, but he's acting like one. Hermione, all the same. Harry, if it makes him go back to Tonks, it'll be worth it. Won't it? Kind of, because, you know, what happens by the time you get to the end of the novel? When this book came out, July 31st of 2007. Um, one of my students, we were in London. One of my students had gotten me tickets to, um, there's a huge podcast party at the, the big um, Waterstones in London. Big, huge, takes up the city block bookstore. <clears throat> and there's an international podcast thing where, you know, they were going to, Podcasts from this party, etc. Um, one of my students had gotten us tickets. And so we got up for the party part and, and we left before the actual book release because they kicked everybody out at nine o'clock to go get in line for the midnight release. But when we got there, I mean, the line had already formed. And there were bunches of people people dressed like Tonks, people dressed like Lupin. There was one couple, Tonks and Lupin. Right? because of the end of the previous book, etc. You know, and then we left, and the next morning, my kids had already finished the book because they'd stayed up all night and read it. <laughs> Two of them had. Um, or the next couple days, after getting to the end, they are like, I wonder what those people who dressed up like Tonks and Lupin felt <laughs> after reading the book, you know. So, we get the extract from the upcoming biography of Albus Dumbledore. And magic is might. I don't care about that. I want to talk about those things. Magic is might. They go off to the <laughs> ministry. And that beautiful statue that had been there before, the wizard, 
the witch, the centaur, the goblin, the house elf, you know, looking up at the wizard and witch. Now instead, there's a different statue. A witch and wizard sitting on ornately carved th thrones, and in foot-high letters at the base of the statue, magic is might. And Harry gets a closer look at the throne and realizes there are actually mounds of carved humans, hundreds and hundreds of naked bodies, men, women, and children, all with rather stupid, ugly faces, twisted and pressed together to support the weight of the handsomely robed wizards. And Hermione says, muggles in their rightful place. It's almost like images of bodies in concentration death camp burial things, just all crammed, and these get pushed into the form of these two thrones, okay? So we're gonna skip a whole bunch to go through the Muggleborn Registration Commission. Harry gets Moody's eye. They release some people. Chapter 14, the thief. I'm gonna skip a lot. He has the vision. He sees Grindelwald take the stop the um yeah the item. Let's call it that. Goblin's Revenge, Chapter 15. Okay. So now they're popping around the countryside, setting up camp and such, and they take the locket. Um, Harry's not in a good mood, and as soon as the locket parts from contact with his skin, he feels better. Okay. They steal some eggs from a farm, and Hermione cooks a really good breakfast. She leaves money for it, so it's not really stealing. And we're told this was their first encounter with the fact that a full stomach make good spirits and empty one bickering and gloomy. Why? Why does a full stomach mean good spirits and empty one bickering and gloom? Okay. Why? Or what is this really showing? Miss the comforts of home? Food? which is matter, equals good spirits. No food, which is obviously no matter, equals bad mood. Rolling is, is kind of embedding what seems a really, really trite, simplistic thing, but it's actually pretty, pretty profound. Because what does it mean? <clears throat> Our bodies determine our outlook. Our bodies determine our attitudes. Why? If we're physically suffering, then what often happens, I'm not gonna point up here, because I don't think the quote unquote soul or spirit is produced by the brain. But if the body is physically going through terrible hardship, what often happens to the spirit? Same thing. Okay? And vice versa. If the soul or spirit is suffering, think Voldemort, what happens to the body? Think Voldemort. The less and less human it becomes. Okay? So, what do we start to see in this chapter? Uh, a rift. A rift. Who's the one who gets angriest if they don't have food? Oh. Why? He's a monster. That's, that's mom literally like the him. one thing he can count on at home. Go back to something Caitlin said. Is Ron a mama's boy? Yes. Something wrong with that? Uh, I mean, he I wouldn't say that he's. I think he wants uh, to be, but he's got a lot of siblings to compete with. He's not a mama's boy like Draco is. No, he's not. He's less of a mama's boy. He's used to, what did you say, Jasper? Food's like the one thing they can count on consistently at home. Food and love. Food and love. They don't have much in terms of material comfort, though, do they? Ron's wearing hand-me-down robes. He has a hand-me-down wand. He didn't get to go to Ollivander's and get a new wand. He did after he became prefect. I mean, first book, second book, third book, fourth book. Okay, He's got a broken wand. Uh, hand me down. Clothes are all wrong size, etc. 
But good food it can be counted on, okay? <clears throat> In other words, this is the first time Ron has ever really had to what? Suffer. Meanwhile, Harry, his entire life has not eaten to his fill, except for when he's been at Hogwarts and at the Weasleys. But at home, you know, Porker eats the lion's share. Okay? So they listen to the radio, they hear Ted taunts and stuff. Hermione calls up Phineas Nigellus, brings him out of the bag and such. We find out, you know, Luna, Neville, those guys tried to do what? From where? Snape's office. And we hear, and Snape might have thought that was a punishment, says Harry. This is page 302. But Jenny, Neville, and Luna probably had a good laugh with Hagrid. Okay, now think about that for a moment. Snape gave as punishment for them breaking into his office to tension with Hagrid. And, and none of the three, these three, Harry, Ron, Hermione, yeah, they don't think that's stupid or they don't kind of go, hmm, why would Snape do that? Because who could he have given to them detention with? The or the twins? Amicus and yeah. the Tarot. Yeah, the Tarot yeah, Twins. It would be one thing if it was like Dolores Umbridge doing this, because she would think that's a real punishment. But Snape knows Hagrid and knows they like Hagrid. And knows Hagrid is what? A good person. Keep going. A member of the Order of the Phoenix. And he knows Jenny's parents are in the Order of the Phoenix. And Jenny's boyfriend is kind of in the Order of the you know. So, the goblin, or they find out the goblin, the um, sword can destroy horcruxes, etc. Um, Ron gets all nasty. Hermione takes him, tells him to take the locket off. He does. Ron says something about Harry's parents being safely out of the way. Harry's like, um, mine are dead. <laughs> and we see Ron split. So, we will pick up on Monday with about where I thought we'd get to. Godric's Hollow. Yes. Uh, nope. No, no. I was just thinking of the theory that, uh, that um, the Dursleys, when the Dursleys were so mean to Harry, because they said that he's a horcrux. But the Dursleys were so mean to Harry, because they don't really. Yeah, they don't really have the respect on him until Voldemort comes to his back. Is it, is it, is it, is the dependency of, like, the effect on the personality of the people around it? Yeah, that's, I mean, the, the Dursleys don't get along with people. Um, so, let me get this straight. You're saying that the reason the Dursleys are so horrible to Harry is because of the Horcrux in him? It could be a possibility, but then I'm just wondering also, but it does is, just... is it dependent on if Voldemort is alive? Because um, he, he wasn't personally affected by himself until Voldemort came back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when, when once Voldemort comes back, that bit of Voldemort in Harry gets activated, so to speak. Right. But before then, not really. I mean, they have to be still know. alive. That's the point of a horcrux. Well, yeah, he's still, he's, of course he's still alive. He's not alive in a physical... No, I mean, like, the pieces of in the horcrux. I think, like, his connection strengthened because, like, the big part was back. So, like, the little bit of Voldemort's always been alive in him. Yeah, yeah. But maybe dormant. Yeah. Asleep. Okay. Yeah. Um, over the weekend, would you be able to send us some of the essay comments? Uh, I'll probably do it on Monday. Okay. When are they going to be due by? Uh, Wednesday the first, I think.